very privileged to have our first panel session today on what are the key issues company boards are considering when they consider the fourth industrial revolution. Um, heavy hitting panel, Angus Armour, Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director for the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Yasmin Allen, Non-Executive Director for Cochlear, Santos and ASX Limited. AJ Bhatia, Managing Director, Consumer Business at carsales.com. And Peter James, Chairman and Non-Executive Director of Macquarie Telecom, Nearmap, Drone Shield and Aquabotics. Please make them welcome. Off, can I say, Melbourne, you're doing great. Currently trending third. Daniel Alzani has got a big future in front of him, but he's not controlling Australia's destiny. So keep asking those hard questions, and Dr. Paris, you're going great. Um, a, qu a common question for everyone, just to kick off. From a board's perspective and outside of share price, how do you determine the level of transformation required to deliver shareholders' long-term value in any business strategy? And what are your tips for measuring business transformation throughout the implementation of that strategy? Angus, can we start with you? Sure, Andrew. Uh, look, I'd, I'd begin by setting context for what is transformation. So transformation is something that can't be unwound. So you look at a company like GE, and sort of 15 or 20 years ago, you might have said that GE was in a period of transformation, but you're seeing some of these steps are now being unwound. So they didn't genuinely transform in some respects. Transformation is something that can't be changed. So if you put that as your context, you're asking, you're asking yourself in your business, how are we fundamentally going to change the way that we're interacting with our customers or with each other in order to deliver a result that's beyond total share price? Uh, and that's a challenge. It can be, you know, we, we all know the stages of innovation, new to market, new to world. Um, there, are, there are clear categories of innovation that we all aspire to have, but what is the potential for you and your company, both inward and what is your potential outward? What are your competitors doing? What are your threats? And it's looking at that broad context for transformation that you start to set the measures that are most relevant to you as you and your company. It's very hard to categorize. So in the ACD, we have 43,000 members. We cut across the whole community. There's no one set of measures that are going to manage for each individual company, each individual circumstance. It's very much down to the individual. Thank you. Yasmin, from your perspective, well, transformation depends where you're starting. Um, you know, you may not need transformation, but um, start with, you know, your asset base, I guess, or what you've got now, and then where you want to go to. So for me, it's about understanding where we are now and where we need to get to and why, why we need to make that change. Um, it could be because of digital disruption. There could be many, many reasons, but... Um, you know, we're in control of our own destiny. We don't transform for the sake of it. We, you know, we, we look at what are the best tools we can use. And if you're talking digital transformation, th no, no, there's many, many tools for us to use as, as companies. But there's got to be a good why, and we've got to take the entire organisation along with us. So transformation is change, and change is about people. So understanding where you're going to, and then being able to set that vision for your organisation, and then the tools come secondary. Thank you. Yeah, for me, transformation is uh, probably a really big and a really scary word. Um, and that, that in itself um, sets the theme of how do you sort of think about transformation. And it starts with clarity, as, as you said. Um, and clarity has got to come from right from the top. Um, once, once the clarity is there, it's about collaborating within the team. And why I say it starts at the top is a lot of the transformation projects fail because there is lack of collaboration between uh, teams. Digital transformation is a good example. A lot of companies want a digital transformation, and you create a chief digital officer, a department called the digital department. Mm. That's possibly the worst way to transform a company. You're sort of creating a department. Um, transformation's got to be led by the CEO. There's advisors to the CEO. It might be the chief digital officer, might be one of them who's um, advising them how, how to transform. And, and then, then the other part is really, because transformation is about people um, and culture, it's got to be bottom-up done as well, not just top-down. It's got to be about the change in um, processes, change in principles. Um, and because it, because it is so big, 
um, breaking it down to small measurable parts is really, really important. Mm -hmm. One of the things that organizations are talking about these days is about being agile, and there's a lot of um, organizations who are adopting agile in their development processes, but that is not good enough unless the CEO and the board also understand um, why, why you're doing that, and, and you know, transformation is a good example of that. Having a board that understands agile, maybe it's a new concept to some boards, would be really, really important, breaking down the problem into 10 smaller problems and measuring the 10, and maybe once you get to the third, the next seven problems actually change. Hmm. Peter. Thanks, Andrew. I might pick up on a comment AJ made, and that is transformation happens in lots and lots of small steps. And I'd suggest a good place to start is with the customer, that person that we often forget about when we're thinking inward. And it's about that customer journey and trying to make things frictionless is, is an area I think that companies uh, can always look at doing better. Uh, and it's about process innovation. And that's often not, shall we say, sexy. We often think about, we're going to talk about moonshots, but often real transformation can come from within. I don't know at Macquarie Telecom, we measure, uh, we're a telco and, and we try to be untelco. We look at every uh, step of the customer journey. How can we make it better and we measure it? And we measure it back to NPS. What does the customer think about us? So a lot of our innovation, Andrew, goes back inside the traditional customer journey as they deal with us. So I think that's another lens that you could look at transformation. Thank you. Um, so we will go into the moonshots next and, and pick up on, on Yasmin's <coughs> comments about being in control of one's own destiny. Um, so moonshots is a term that Google coined to uh, describe yeah. explosive, disruptive innovation. How does a Actually, it was coined by the President of the United States when they wanted to put the first man on the moon, JFK. He said, we're going to go for the moon. Well, I guess they coined from that, but he, he said it when they actually didn't have the technology to be able to deliver on that. So that really is what Moonshot is, it's way out there and then sort of backfilling, isn't it? Absolutely, so fantastic. <laughs> Within that context, keen for the, the, the panel's views on how do you balance the Moonshot compared to incremental innovation? Angus, your views. I think Yasmin's context is important. Um, President Kennedy was able to call for a moonshot by marshalling the resources of the United States by, by essentially, and this is the critical business perspective, by being able to um, put the risk out basically to the population of the United States of America, right? So there was a tremendously diverse risk base, each taking incremental risk to allow them to do something that could you know, conceivably fail and fail dramatically. And Google, with all the resources they have at their disposal, they can talk about moonshots. They can take really big risks, doing something dramatically different where the technology doesn't exist because the implication for any individual shareholder is pretty low. So the first context for any firm that's contemplating a moonshot, if a firm is contemplating a moonshot, is how can I actually manage that risk? How can I make sure that this isn't a fatal risk from the perspective of the firm or has such a damaging impact on my shareholders that they lose faith in our ability to get things done? There are ways to do that, but it's, it, that's the platform you have to build on to begin with. Yeah, the other important perspective, I think, to, to draw on this um, is you know, the, the, the ability of the entire ecosystem to mobilize behind you. So when Bill Ferris and the ESA board came out and said, let's do a moonshot around medical technology, he was looking across the entire economy and saying, actually, we have individual firms and universities and practitioners who can all contribute to a tremendous outcome, allow individual firms essentially to take segmented moonshots within their, within their businesses, relying on the ecosystem to bring them along. Um, we're, we're, a, we're a country that's behind the ball on innovation, frankly, I think on most, on most um, global indices. Uh, and, and that sort of inspirational call for a moonshot based on what we can do well and we do so many things well uh, is something I need, we need to listen to. Thank you. Y yeah, yes, look, I think, you know, moonshot, it's a great sort of idea to galvanise a whole team or a company around a goal that's big and, you know, audacious and out there. And I don't know, though, I think actually that can be quite dangerous as well because you can't have a different moonshot every year you can't, um, you know, if you fail at that moonshot, then you've sort of lost credibility as a management team. 
Um, I'd prefer to think of it as a, mi a vision which is driven by, you know, the core strategy, which comes, as Peter's already said, you know, through un really understanding your market and your customer. Um, and I use the word, which is very unsexy, uh, relentless execution, because the companies that I've sat on the boards of that have done the be you know, have performed very, very well, have actually been incredibly good at aligning where we're going. So I guess that's moonshot type, but not, not, not way out there. You know, a, a, um, a vision of a, of a path that we can actually achieve, aligning with that, and then behind it, excellent execution. Being brilliant at execution will deliver. And then you look back three years later, and you've done all this incremental execution and great delivery, and you go, well, actually, that probably was moonshot. I mean, look what we've delivered. But it's sort of, it's more incremental than it is, you know, putting something out there that could be destabilizing. Yeah, for me, building on, on comments from both the previous two speakers, um, incremental and, and disruptive innovation, or moonshots, they're equally important. Uh, you, you can't, I can't choose one over the other, but I can relate one to the other. And you know, starting with incremental innovation, find the, the thing about innovation is innovation is a culture in an organization. Innovation is not a department. We just talk about transformation and similar light. Um, and if innovation is a culture, it is something you want everyone in the organization to be doing. Not everyone in the organization will be creating a moonshot every day. That's just not going to happen. And that's where incremental innovation comes in. It's about building the culture. It's about having a humble definition on purpose of innovation. So my definition is uh, a new thinking that creates value. We run hackathons at car sales, uh, several hackathons every year. And one of the hackathons um, that... Um, that I get reminded of from six, seven years ago. It's where a team got together and um, they wanted to do agile stand-ups ar around tables. They bought these tables from IKEA, they built the tables themselves and they can put the tables up and down and that was, that, that was fitting of that definition. That didn't require someone to be a software developer to be innovative. Um, slowly we had 55% people in our hackathon who were non-technology people. And that was a really proud moment for me because it was starting to be a culture in an organization and not a department. And, but from that, it gave, gives confidence to the wider workforce that we can have a say, we, we can build upon um, you know, the small things that we do on a daily basis. And confidence leads to, to moonshots as well. And, and we have done a few things that um, are not quite um, the sending person on the moon, et cetera, but, but they are moonshots in, in, in the scheme of things. We've built uh, patented software that uh, recognizes a car from its picture and, and that sort of um, software, um, AI-based software, is, is a world first with the best accuracy across the world. But it, but it came from humble beginnings. Thank you, Ajay. Peter? I think that's a pretty good place to start coming from humble beginnings. When I hear about moonshots and you talk about Google X, to be frank, in an Australian context at that level, my eyes start to glaze over because, let's face it, uh, Google, Google X, it's, you know, 10 times. They've got huge amounts of cash and they're prepared to fail. It's something that I think we in Aussie culture, we still struggle with failure, whereas in the US, it's a rite of passage. So to me, uh, moonshot, as Yaz said, it's a call to arms, it's a focus. Um, but it is built upon lots and lots of small steps. And then you wake up one day and you've achieved something special. I was saying to my colleagues before we came on stage, I was, uh, I was fortunate to be involved with Ionet from the very early days, right till when we sold it to TPG. And we had this uh, uh, advertisement that we put out when we became number two ISP in Australia. And we said it took us 15 years to become number two overnight. And I think that's where you wake up one day and you have actually created, in local terms, a moonshot, but lo lots and lots of small steps. Thank you. Angus, a question specifically for you that we hear and read a lot around the war on talent. What's the mood in boardrooms around the war on talent, particularly technical talent, and, and what are people doing about it? But there's no question that skills are one of the top items that directors are focusing on now. And as you say, it's, it's technical skills, it's, it's all the skills in our economy. Um, there's a clear bias towards a technical skill conversation because most, as the panel's been discussing, most boards are now concerned about innovation and disruption and how to build in more technology and how they provide 
um, services to their customers. But it's beyond the, the war for talent in the sense of trying to find the right people who exist now in the economy. I think it's broader than that. Uh, and your, your next panel actually might be a great opportunity to ask some pointed questions because it's, it's about building talent in the economy. It's about our school system, TAFE and universities. It's about encouraging people to look at the breadth of technology um, that they can look at in their careers. Uh, there, there, is, there is a deepening concern in boardrooms about our access to talent. Thank you. Um, Yasmin, keen on your insights on, on how uh, a, a board changes its mindset in relation to tech, depending on the type of business. So Cochlear, big R&D, Santos, a lot of automation and efficiency, uh, ASX platforms and transactions. So how does the mindset change at boardroom level um, when it comes to technology, depending on the type of business? Yeah, it, it does. It's definitely a different focus. But as I said earlier, you sort of start with where you are now and where you want to get to. So, yeah, you know, Cochlear um, actually you know, exists because of technology, because of an incredible invention that came out of Melbourne University. Um, you know, we were the first country and the first company to invent, you know, the cochlear implant. Um, so we have an organisation that is full of engineers and wonderful people who think, you know, very clearly around medical technology. But what we've seen is a great opportunity for cochlear moving into more customer-facing technology. So rather than just implant the patient and the, the um, recipient could potentially wear that if they're implanted as a child for the next 100 years um, and then let them sort of go through um, technology or digital mainly, we can now have, well, we have, you know, data that from the chipsets. We have um, ability to um, help these people map their own hearing um, from home. Um, we can give them better service because we can understand if they're switched off. For example, if a child is switched off at school, it can send a, we've now got technology, so it can send an a, um, alarm to the mother or to, to us. Someone even, um, we just had our AGM last week and uh, the CEO told the story of someone who'd lost their, their external processor and they rang Cochlear and we can actually find it now because of the technology and not that we trace our customers, of course. Um, <laughs> But, you know, so there's so many more advantages that um, we can bring to our customer base through changing technology. Even our sales force, for example, we do SMS instead of, you know, inbound calls, which are difficult for people who, who can't hear. But it means that our inbound call centre can now deal with more, you know, difficult issues that people are having with their implants. So, um, so I guess we've done a minor pivot or an addition in terms of the investment in technology at Cochlear, and that is um, changing the way the company is perhaps becoming more, you know, customer focused. Um, at Santos, we use technology, obviously, um, sensors in the pipes, predictive maintenance, um, drones in the field, 3D seismic. I mean, all of these things are changing the way an oil and gas operator can um, drive efficiencies and um, increase production and also reduce hazardous um, um, occupations of, you know, difficult, we can send sensors in instead of sending people into, you know, hazardous areas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it just goes on and on. ASX, obviously, we're building the world's first industrial um, blockchain to replace our post-trade settlement system. Again, that's a completely different way of thinking. And um, the board, a couple of years ago, um, encouraged management to go around the world and look at who was um, doing the best in, in blockchain, and we came up with a small company called Digital Asset Holdings based out of New York. We took an equity stake in that, in that business, and we're now building, it's a two-year build, um, you know, the world's first industrial, you know, blockchain. So, yeah, very, very different companies and very different outcomes, but all being changed and driven by the impact of technology. It's quite exciting, actually. <laughs> Thank you, no, congratulations there, very exciting use cases. AJ, um, car sales, one of Australia's great platform success stories. Um, keen for your insights on acquisition as a strategy to, to scale globally. Um, so you've been involved in a few yourself. How important is uh, acquisition to the innovation story? Mm. Um, so this, in, innovation is a mix of many things and acquisition is absolutely one key channel for us. It's been very successful for us. In, in international terms, I'll give you an example of um, you know, firstly, t talent is, is, is not just here in Australia, talent's all over the world, and, and the more you travel, the more you realize that. And um, so one of the companies we acquired um, many years ago, 50% stake in, and then eventually last year, 100% stake in is a company in, in Korea. 
And after acquisition, the first thing that we did in, in the acquisition was ensure that we retained the key management team. And it's all about people, it's all about talent, and that, um, that talent can drive, um, drive our global businesses, but then also uh, feedback into the ecosystem around the globe. So when we learn something in Korea, we apply that not only in Australia, but also in our Latin American businesses as well. Um, so that, that's been really good for us from an innovation perspective. Um, the other thing, the, uh, a more local example, we acquired um, an interest in an inspection business. Um, so, and this is a local business here in Australia. Um, and the founders of that business were really, really good at doing car inspections and the, know everything about car inspections. Um, and they were trying to disrupt the traditional inspection market. Um, fr from, from their perspective, they, they wanted to partner with us because we bring the best of digital and uh, that we bring the best of thinking around how to scale a business uh, with, with digital and technology. And, and the manage uh, has been a marriage made in heaven because they tell us everything about inspecting cars. We tell them everything about how to re reduce the inspection time from two hours to 30 minutes, but still do an inspection that has higher quality than the two hour inspection. And that's a really good example of innovation that comes from acquisition, but where one plus one equals to three. Thank you. Uh, Peter, keen to get your insights. Everyone here would be familiar with the Macquarie Telecom brand, but you've got some really exciting Aussie tech as part of their, the boards that you sit on. Um, could you share with us some of the use cases across um, Nearmap, uh, um, Drone Shield and Aquabotics? Thanks, Andrew. And yes, uh, I am fortunate to spend quite a bit of time in uh, some of the most exciting tech companies that Australia's uh, got to offer. If we talk about the first one, Nearmap, it's a group of uh, grown-up entrepreneurs who've built some amazing technology to put it in context. We fly every day uh, using some smart cameras in commercial planes. We capture 4,000 square kilometres of data every day of the year, have done for many years, down to a resolution of seven centimetres. That's six to seven terabytes a day that we capture, we process, and we serve up onto the desktop of our customers who are in the uh, architecture, construction, engineering, insurance, first responders uh, right across Australia, New Zealand and the US. Uh, the Chicago police, for example, before they go out on a call, they call up the near map image current of, uh, the, uh, of the location and know exactly what they're going to get themselves into. Um, great business model uh, and growing rapidly around the world. The next one, uh, Drone Shield, uh, you mentioned. Uh, we've all heard about uh, commercial off-the-shelf drones, those little things that we get given for Christmas and we love to take photos with, as uh, you said, with Santos, used for great commercial good, but more and more we see them used for nefarious bad reasons. Um, prison walls are made for keeping bad people in. They're not very good at keeping those little quadcopters out. Um, big uh, mass crowd events. Uh, we um, detect drones and we stop them. We have a, a, a thing called a drone gun. It's actually a jammer that will knock a drone out of the sky. We'll detect it up to two kilometres, knock it out of the sky um, at two kilometres. So we're working with uh, law enforcement, military. Uh, we've protected the uh, Hawaiian Ironman, the Winter Olympics, Boston Marathon, Commonwealth Games, and on it goes. Best way to get an idea is if you Google French President Emmanuel Macron drone gun you'll see the French president looking in awe at a great Australian piece of technology. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the last one you mentioned, aquabotics, that is about underwater drones and surface drones. And if you think about all the technology that comes out of this, that's what goes into drones. Put a watertight case around that, and again, some smart technology. Uh, our uh, most uh, um, exciting uh, uh, development in aquabotics is autonomous surface drones swarming. And again, just Google swarm diver. We can swarm these uh, micro drones uh, a metre long, uh, a thousand of them at a time. And when they detect something, they can actually dive down. And you can imagine what might happen next. We're working with navies around the world. And this That's is smart cool. technology that is being developed and taken global from Australia. 
That's just incredible. And I think we heard a challenge there to find the French president and uh, shoot out <laughs> on your social, the French president using Aussie tech. Um, very exciting. I'll definitely do that when, we, when I get off stage. Um, Angus, as we continue to digitise and automate, um, how central is cybersecurity policy at a boardroom um, and, and understanding the risks and, and evolving? Andrew, uh, events of the past few years have put cyber clearly at the top of the board agenda, um, sometimes in almost a, a defensive frame. And I think the next evolution of, of cyber has to be in the broader context of all the risk management activity that's underway in an organization. And that's a very important step for us to take. So when we talk to directors about uh, cyber, they're, they're, very well, they're now very well briefed about here are the risks involved in cyber. They're all at different stages in terms of how advanced they are in protecting themselves. Uh, but the most important step we feel they need to take is cultural. It's about bringing, bringing that entire frame of reference into the broader culture of the organization so that people understand and accept cyber risk like any risk they have in their business. Uh, if you think of the evolution of work, um, work health safety culture, that, that really reached its peak, its, its optimal um, performance when people began to live that and breathe that as part of their corporate culture. That's still a step that boards are, are having, to, having to make in their organizations. I would say that's probably the most important step at this point. Thank you. Um, Yasmin, I'd like to ask you about um, successful corporate strategy and committing to human-centred technology design. And, and by doing that, just some context, I want to quote Steve Wozniak, who was quoted in the AFR last month, sharing that Apple had distinguished itself from many of its fellow tech giants by focusing on top quality products, its reputation and brand, whereas companies like Google and Facebook were mining you for money. Um, <laughs> how, how important is human-centred design? And, and are boards considering it? Well, I, th I think you're sort of where you're getting to there is purpose, and um, I think it is very important for a company to think very clearly about their purpose, especially in this environment where we're having, you know, massive changes in um, our workforces and um, you know the macro geopolitical situation with trade wars, etc. It's very easy, I think, to get frightened by what's you know happening out there. But if we come back to you know, the core purpose and why we exist, I think it, it's, it's one of those, um, it's like sort of your vision, you know, it helps align you as to where you're heading as a company. For example, Cockley, it's quite easy. Um, you know, our purpose is to help people here. So, in fact, um, what's so incredible about that company is the amount of volunteers, people who actually work for a for-profit company for no remuneration is a really um, exciting part of, um, you know, purpose. Um, and Santos, um, a little bit harder in, in that sector, but, you know, we export um, LNG. Natural gas has 40% less emissions than coal, so we believe every ship that goes out with LNG is displacing a coal-fired power station in, in China. Um, so as a transition fuel to renewables, that, you know, is a great purpose, and that helps us galvanise and understand where we're, where we're heading. Um, at the ASX, our purpose is to be the world's most respected marketplace, and we're doing that, as I said earlier, through um, using um, uh, leading-edge technology to deliver cost savings and better you know, opportunities for our, for our customers. So all of those things lead to your question, I guess, which I'm taking as around sort of AI and how we think about our future and, uh, and the way our companies are um, adopting and embracing artificial intelligence. And I do believe from a board perspective that, um, or I don't, we haven't come to the solution of how we get a line of sight from the boardroom into the algorithms and the, um, the you know, the decision making and the behaviours that are being embedded in the algorithms that our organisations are using and building every day. And we've seen some examples of, um, a couple of weeks ago, I think, Amazon said that they're going to shelve their, um, they'd built an AI system around recruitment, but all that did was amplify back to them, so it ga they gave the computer all their previous, um, you know, decisions around recruitment, but it just amplified back to them 
the issues that they already had, i.e. lack of diversity, lack of multiculturalism, all that sort of thing. So we've got to be somehow, and, and I don't have a solution for this because you know I'm sitting on the boards of these companies, but we maybe it's through culture, maybe it's through human-centered design, but we have to have the sorts of people in our leadership teams that understand the risks of what we're building and can highlight those through our purpose and what we stand for back to the organization, to the senior leadership team. So we don't make mistakes. I mean, the life insurance companies yesterday said that they're going back on, you know, they said that they're gonna not, um, you can't get life insurance if you've had a mental health issue. So you build that into your algorithm, nobody's gonna call out for help who's got a mental, you know, that is not the solution that we want in society. So we have to reflect back on ourselves and think very carefully, are we just gonna amplify the issues that we've already got in our organizations around diversity and et cetera? and behaviours, or can we build something that's a little bit different? I don't think we have the solution for that yet. Thank you. AJ, I'd like to explore that a little bit further at boardroom level. So we've got emerging tech capable of doing great new things, um, but the regulatory environment not yet set. So to what degree um, do boards take into consideration the possibilities around future regulation when you're looking at uh, new and emerging tech use cases? Look, re regulation can be scary, but can also be an opportunity for businesses. It's, um, it's, it's about, one, staying close to, to, to government uh, in, at board level and executive level, understanding what you're thinking, influencing in many cases what they're thinking, um, so, so it's fair and reasonable um, in, in, you know, in its net job creation, for example, rather than not. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, in, in terms of our, our industry, for example, regulation could change um, in a few years' time and um, a government could come in and say, um, we will only sell electric vehicles from year 2000 and something. Um, that would change our industry a lot. That would change um, car sales a lot, for example, and, um, and that's the sort of things that we have to be aware of and, and understand. And having the right talent on, on board, that's encouraging um, our executives to be aware of this or, or listening to the executives or talking about this is, is very important. Um, I don't quite think the, the board members need to sit there and evaluate all these risks, uh, but they need to be tuned to these risks um, and the executives are the advisors who, who then give the recommendations on how to um, evolve the company so you don't have to use the scary world called transformation in, in five years time. Thank you. Peter, with all your experience about commercialising Aussie tech, for our entrepreneurs in the room, what, um, what tips would you have for pitching boards, whether it's acquisition or raising capital? Yes, Andrew, the first thing to know is that people, particularly on boards, investors, we're all time poor, be crisp, make sure you know what your message is and get it across very quickly. You know, it's really hard to pick winners. My own uh, philosophy that I've learnt over many years, firstly, is it a problem worth solving? Is it that uh, absolute pain point that is going to make a difference somewhere that is worth going down the journey? The next one, it's a lot about the management team, uh, the entrepreneur, uh, the people that own this. Um, what experience do they have? But more importantly, what's their psyche? Are they up for the rocky road of being an entrepreneur? Um, are they able to uh, iterate, to pivot, and to take the tough decisions uh, that uh, ultimately you've got to make in small business. And finally, uh, believe it or not, um, how do you make money out of it? Um, which is important. Um, one of my philosophies is work hard, have fun and make money. And why is money important? Because if you're not making money, I've learnt you're not having fun. And we only go around once and, and you've got to have fun no matter what you do. And there's good days and there's not so good days. I use another term, getting rubber to the road. I look for teams that are practical, get rubber to the road, rather than perhaps, Andrew, rubber to the sky. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Angus, we talked about cyber security at a board level. Um, keen on your insights, since the introduction of mandatory data breach legislation and notification, um, have you, are you observing any exemplars of who's doing it well, protecting customers' privacy and security? Andrew actually did a poll at work because I couldn't answer this question myself. So I sent it out to my colleagues and said, do we have an exemplar? And, and the answer was, was no, which is not actually a negative answer. It's just we've not seen enough 
um, in, in our work and, and working with boards to say, look, this is actually the best case. Uh, but we have seen very encouraging uh, investments by boards in making sure that they're in compliance. Um, I, but you know, it, it's, it's not quite early days, but there, there are certainly, um, uh, I think, probably another six to 12 months to go before we actually see who's, who's going to respond best to adversity is going to be the answer to that question, actually. It won't necessarily be the, the board that does the absolutely bullet, you know, there, there's a bulletproof um, context for this, but there, the, you know, with the evolution of, of cyber crime, you know, we're, we're all exposed. It's how you respond to that exposure. It's how you react and how you deal with your customers, I think, that will actually set the bar for the exemplar. Thank you. Um, Yasmin, there's heightened sensitivity across society around the potential for technology to displace workers and, and jobs. Um, what gives you confidence or why would you be optimistic that we can create higher paying jobs in this fourth industrial revolution? I am actually optimistic. Um, look, I think those, you know, we've had some very early sort of line in the sand forecasts around, you know, 60% of jobs are going to be displaced. Um, you know, these these sort of scary headlines keep coming out every day. But what really annoys me about those things is a, what I call sort of one-sided forecasts. And that's taking, you know, one side of what's going on and then extrapolating that into the future without actually looking at the other side, the opportunity, you know, the risk and the opportunity side. Um, it was a bit like, you know, 20 years ago or maybe 30 years ago, they said, oh, you know, the advent of computers, we're all going to have so much spare time. Well, has anybody got any spare time? I think we're working harder and faster and, you know, so these things actually don't pan out the way that the initial forecasts, um, you know, want to sort of frighten you into believing. And in fact, in the examples that I was talking about earlier, you know, we've put on between 300 and 400 additional people at Cochlear just in the sales, digital, marketing, um, the call centres, um, you know, customer service, you know, that's quite a lot in terms of our total sales force. And that, by giving a better service to our customer, will improve our st the standing of our brand and will drive greater revenue and then there'll be more engineers that will follow and more, you know, the traditional sort of people that we employ at Cochlear and the same at at Santos, by taking cost out of the Cooper Basin, we can now drill, we've almost doubled the amount of drilling that we're doing there. We're actually producing a lot more out of that basin than people thought was possible. Um, so, you know, what competition does is that it, 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 cutting jobs or the changing of jobs isn't just going to end up in higher margins and we're all just going to be sitting around reaping in the... Competition's going to mean that that what's released from those companies in terms of cost savings will be ploughed back in, into investment in growth. And it'll be investment in, I mean, the trick here is the investment, though, could be and possibly, probably will be in different types of skills and different types of roles. Um, so I think we as organisations have to take that responsibility of understanding how our workforce is changing in the next 10 years. And we should be able to do that if we, if we you know, earlier you talked about transformation, we talked about strategy. If we understand what our customers want, where our businesses are going, we definitely should be able to understand the sort of workforce that we want. And then we should look at our existing workforce and we should say, how do we move those, bring those people along with us? And that's not, I mean, I say this often, actually, and I get poo-pooed by a lot of other company directors, and I'm not looking at you, <laughs> but I just think of you as all the company directors. Um, because, but the reason I say it is, it's not altruistic. It's, it's, it is the right thing to do, but it's also the right thing for the business. Because if we show our, our staff, our employees, that you know, we, there's a future for them, that we care, that we're not just going to be shown the door when we bring in the next you know, technology replacement, then you get the, the, you know, the extra mile, you get more confidence in your staff, so they're more likely to innovate, you get better productivity. You get, it's actually a good thing. Um, you know, at ASX, um, the digital asset who are building our blockchain replacement, we have a new um, language, DAML. And so we've set up a DAML toolkit, it's digital asset something language. Um, and the toolkit will enable people to come and play on our platform to learn our language and that will drive the ecosystem. Now, that'll be good for us, but it'll be good for Australia because the critical mass of people that are coming back to Australia to work on this, you know, world-leading um, blockchain investment 
um, will spawn other industries and other um, opportunities in other organisations, um, other industries, but also in our own industry. There'll be, by taking cost out um, for our customers and for ourselves, there'll be a whole lot of services and products that will generate revenue and generate more jobs into the, into the future. So I am actually very optimistic, but I think the narrative has to change and we as business leaders have to lead that narrative. We have to say, you know, we're going to help our workforces transition. It's imminently, the World um, Economic Forum just put out, uh, I think um, they did a study around, um, you know, transition of workforce. There's 48 fit for purpose potential jobs that we can retrain per person, that we can train our people into. 48 opportunities. So that's what we should be doing. Fantastic, long, thank sorry. you. <laughs> AJ, what sort of emerging techs should have boards excited and any tips on how you have those discussions to balance the risk and reward? Mm. Firstly, I, I probably go back to, to your point around um, it's not really about the tech, it's about the problem you're solving. Um, but having said that, understanding technology and what problems it can solve is equally important. So this, this, this also goes to education in terms of the board, in terms of the executives, and employing the right people who are across these latest trends. Um, you know, the, one, the, the three technologies that come to mind that are being talked around uh, many of the boardrooms that, that I know of um, are AI and automation that can happen through AI, um, Internet of Things, um, and blockchain. And, and um, all of those technologies, you know, to give you the car sales example, um, we haven't quite found a use for blockchain yet. Um, and I'm not disappointed by that. Um, you, you know, we, you, you want to make sure that the business case is strong and, and you um, put the investment where the investment will give a return to your customers. And eventually, th that will translate uh, to a return for your, uh, for your shareholders too. Um, on the other hand, uh, AI is, is, is an investment that we have made, and we've made some really strong returns from AI. Um, and you know, the example that I was giving uh, to you guys earlier was around uh, or, um, images. Uh, one of the technologies we've built, we call it Cyclops. It's able to take an image of a car, and from the image of a car, it can recognize the make and the model and the, and the series and a number of other things um, about the car. Car identification has been a core problem of our business for years and years. Most of us don't actually know what car we drive. Um, it, so if, if I asked you, you might tell me, look, I, I drive the, uh, the you know, a Toyota Corolla, but you probably don't know whether it's an SX or an LX. And if you know that it's an SX or an LX, you probably don't know that it was built in 2009, not 2010, because when the dealer sold it to you, the dealer told you the marketing year was 2010, but the build year was 2009. And the compliance year, by the way, was 2011. So you can literally pick the year that, um, and, and, so, so, so by automating all of that, you can get more accuracy. And if you get more accuracy, you can, um, you can get more accuracy around values of cars. Um, and, and then um, for a marketplace like us, which transacts on accurate values, it's really, really important. Um, so we've had some, um, some really, and I, I feel like in the past, we, we've had the opportunity to automate with structured data. What AI allows us to do is a greenfield opportunities for majority of the companies to automate with unstructured data, data that you couldn't automate with in the past, that ability exists today. And, and that will feed into, you know, in, in a very small way, the industrial revolution as well, and, and, and retraining will be required because many of the jobs um, that exist today will, will not be there tomorrow. That's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Thank you. Peter asked Angus earlier about the, the war for tech talent. Um, can we specifically look at software engineering um, a, as a basis for enabling all of our future tech success? How can we go about making Australia a centre of excellence for software engineers? Thanks, Andrew. I, I think you've uh, bowled the hardest question uh, right at the end because when I reflect and, and I started my uh, career as a programmer, which is now a software engineer, what I call 100 years ago, and you know, I've been working on government committees and industry boards to solve just this problem for decades. Um, the exciting thing, the challenging thing, it is now far more relevant because we're not just talking about influencing our daily lives. This is the way we live. 
uh, and you know the people in this audience, uh, you're fortunate to be working in an industry that is just part of everyday life and is relevant to us. But the challenge is that we're in this global war for talent. And if you go to Bangalore, start up Saturday Bangalore, you know, we all talk about Silicon Valley, but AJ and I were talking about Seoul. You know, you've only got to go to Seoul and see the deep technology that's there. So it's, it's a global war for talent, and it's clearly got to be a um, cooperation between uh, academia, between governments and industry, and it, it's a constant battle. If I just reflect on each of those very briefly, academia, Australian universities uh, and research centres are doing world-class um, research that is attracting and developing software engineers, but perhaps I'll be a bit topical. I'm a big believer in open source as well as an adjunct, not instead of. So the general assemblies, the coding schools, etc., they're putting out people that often have a different approach. They may have come in not through formal STEM, which I did, but they may come in through social sciences. Uh, you know, I've seen political scientists, communications, experts go and do some uh, uh, software engineering at one of these open source schools and contribute as part of a multifaceted, very diverse software engineering uh, team. In terms of government, clearly government have a big role to play as, as a huge employer. But again, being topical, I'm a, a believer in attracting talent from overseas. Uh, and again, the diversity of thought uh, the diversity of thinking and experience that some immigrants, some new people to this country bring to our dev teams is quite profound. If you think about what Australia has to offer, what, are we what have we, we got that very few other countries in the world have got? We've got lots of sunshine, we're safe, we're a happy, successful place to live and we should attract people that want to come and work here and bring their skills with them and blend them in with what we're developing. Thirdly, uh, industry, as Yaz said, industry's got to take a leadership role in this as well uh, because it's our industries, and I'll just pick one, Macquarie Telecom, where we specialise in cyber security. The whole um, need for experts in software, cyber security, if you think about um, cyber economic warfare and where the world will go, if ever, unfortunately, there is a war, it's going to be the software engineers that lead it. So the collaboration we do uh, with um, universities in Macquarie Telecom, with the Defence Department uh, and, uh, and the cyber security experts in Canberra just to build this enabled software engineer but cyber economic uh, uh, workforce. Multifaceted, Andrew. Um, it's a problem that is only going to get bigger uh, and can only be solved by each of academia, uh, government and industry collaborating. Thank you. I'm sure we're going to get to explore those uh, issues with our political leaders shortly. Mm -hmm. um, the online questions have gone uh, off, so unfortunately I'm only going to be able to ask each panellist one question each, and if I could ask that uh, responses be kept to 20 seconds, so just uh, short and sharp. Maybe Angus first, Man Mahesh Krisnan. With the fourth industrial revolution, how important is it to have all board members of the question, but maybe even any, with a deep technical bent? Well, our, our philosophy is that all board members should should have some understanding of the entire environment. We don't believe in in any individual board member being responsible for a dimension of the business because it takes away from their their collective responsibility for the function of the organization. But but to have a sensible conversation about the future of your organization, like, like Asmund was talking about, everyone needs to make the effort to understand. So along the same lines then, uh, Yasmin, from Dr. Paris, how can boards make better technology-related decisions, um, which are increasingly um, all decisions, when so many board members are often non-technical? Well, you know, as Angus says, a board is a collection of um, skills that come together with a lot of good advice from management. Don't forget there's a lot of technical skills are in the management team and they're the ones running the company. But yes, th uh, you know, there does need to be an understanding. But the understanding has to be at a higher sort of level in that you don't have time in a board discussion to drill down into an individual piece of technology. 
and you do have to, as a board, because you're sitting up there, you do have to trust that you have the right people in the organisation who do have the skills to understand what is the right technology for you. But what the board brings is the board has to have a good understanding of the value drivers of the business, um, and obviously that's risk as well as opportunity, um, and they need to be able to have a very deep understanding, you know, sort of of the industry, but then a lot of board members bring, um, you know, very good experience from other industries, which is really important. Actually, it was funny, yesterday I had a board meeting in Adelaide and we were sitting there, and I'm not an oil and gas expert, of course, my background is banking, but what I was bringing to the table was really pushing them to think a bit harder around what they're doing in the oil and gas. So, you know, all these different um, um, skill sets that are brought onto the board all play a part to deliver a better outcome. If they were all the same, if they were all oil and gas or all technology or all legal or all, you know, whatever, you, you actually would just have group think. So, yes, there does have to be some understanding of technology, but more from a strategic point of view. How can technology drive our business? What's the threat coming over the horizon from our competitors using technology to have a better, you know, customer interface or whatever than, than us? And those sorts of questions are often not sitting in that deep technologist. I think you have to be tech savvy, but not necessarily deeply technically because if you, you know if you if you're running sort of a, a very technical um, part of the business you don't have that um, experience or mindset to be able to actually look at the impact and the business as a whole so so yes I agree there should be technology people on the board but these people are people who've maybe been CEOs as well and had very strong strategic backgrounds um, with an interest or an experience in technology as well Thank you. AJ from Colin Dominish, Global Context. How can Australia, industry in Australia join forces and collaborate to innovate in ways that change our global relevance for the better? Yeah, um, Australia's starting to do better on a global stage. It's, it's something that, you know, and you, you mentioned it at the start, Angus, that in a, every innovation index that we look at, we, we're sort of not quite there yet. Um, and, and it's about, um, you know, I, I visited Silicon Valley at the start of this year. I was there in February, and one of the things that I picked up from the Valley, and, and it's not about creating Silicon Valley here in Australia. It's not going to happen. It's not, we don't want to replicate that. But what we do want to learn from is what can we pick from the Valley? What can we pick from Israel? What can we pick from Bangalore? And the thing that I picked from the Silicon Valley is collaboration even within Australia. Forget outside of Australia. It was all about um, something that Yasmin mentioned. Um, the Silicon Valley, as much as we talk about it's an ideas um, land, it's actually about execution more than ideas. And the more and more you, you talk to the VCs there, they're so open. So I visited the first VC. The first VC goes, uh, he, he's, um, um, he's an idea. He's, he's the three companies working on this. You should go and talk to these guys. And it was not on my itinerary to visit these companies, but I go and then visit these companies. And they tell me, by the way, you should visit them. And some of them are competitors, but they still refer me to each other. And then I ask the question, I go, hang on, why are you guys so open? Because I'm not used to this. Mm. And the answer was, it's all in execution. It's not about the idea. Mm. And, and that's the thing that I learned from the, from the Valley. Um, you know, Israel is, is a great example of when you start um, developing a product, you, um, you, you develop it to be global day one, or at least you yeah. think of global day one. So, you know, there's so many learnings, and learnings can only happen when you're connected with these people. Um, so, you know, you know, visiting Israel, understanding how they work, visiting the Valley, how, understanding how they work, and picking up on that, visiting Bangalore, that's really important. Thank you. And Peter, final question uh, from David Gadecki. As board members, what do you want to see in any plan for technological transformation that an executive presents to you? That's a really good one. Um, firstly, that they've thought it through. Uh, secondly, that it makes business sense, that they've got the resource to deliver on it, uh, and that they own it. You know, that's what I look for, that something's presented. I want to see that it's signed off by all of the executives, the whole team, not just, say, the CIO, but everyone at the executive level and right through the organisation is going to own it, be accountable with the board for delivery. Can I add to that? I also think the why. Why are we doing it? Mm. You know, who, who, what problem are you solving? 
Is it to get it closer to our customer, or is it to take cost out, or is it to the, the why? Because the why will keep you on track. Because some of these programs can go for two or three years, and they come, I see a lot of, um, you know, um, we call them traffic light, you know, that come up to the board, and they're all green, 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 green. But three years down the track, and you've got new board members, everything's green because it's all going on, but why are we doing this? And, and what are we not doing because we're doing this? So always, I think, keep right up front the why, because sometimes the why changes, or you know, the why is the thing that keeps you going and aligns you. I think that's really important, because technology is about people. Thank you so much. Some incredible insights into what's been discussed at the board. If I could invite our team just to come out with a small thank you for our panellists. Um, really appreciate your honesty and candour in terms of what the boards are thinking about in Australia today. Can we please give Angus, Yasmin, AJ and Peter a big round of applause? Well done, Angus. <laughs>